It's all very familiar, isn't it? The songs that we sing and the traditions that we have, uh, from the little kids' bell choir to Silent Night in a few moments we light the candle to the beautiful rendition of Away in a Manger, a little town of Bethlehem, it's all familiar. It's been familiar all season, and one of the challenges, I think, of communicating the truth of God's grace in this time is that it is so familiar. Because most of you presume to know what's going to be said before anybody says it. Blah, 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 baby Jesus in the manger, let's go open presents, right? You've got your traditions and I've got mine. When my kids were little, I told you they're all old now. When they're little, we would have Christmas Eve services here at our church. We'd drive to Wheaton where my in-laws live, and we'd have dinner and open presents and go to a candlelight service at 11 o'clock and get home after midnight and get up at the crack of dawn, open our presents, and then drive to my folks' house in Crystal Lake by noon. By the 26th, I hated Christmas. The house is a mess. There's presents everywhere. There's wrapping paper. I just wanted it to be over. But now I, I romanticize those days. I forget all the stress and the, and the pace, and I just think, I wish for those. I pine for those days when I see the kids up here. Now it's all gift cards and cash for my kids. Some of the magic is gone. You've got your traditions and the familiar things, and so do I. One of the most familiar passages from the Old Testament, of course, we all know the Luke 2 story, thanks to Linus and Charles Schultz, but in the Old Testament, one of the most familiar passages is what we heard read a moment ago from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. This is the four names of Jesus we've been studying. Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called, say them with me, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This last name is what I want to focus on here with you this morning. Prince of Peace. We've been in a series examining these four names. Isaiah gives us this, this rounded out picture of just who it is in the manger. You know, we sing these familiar songs, Away in a Manger, a little town of Bethlehem, and I think because it's so familiar, we forget who's in there. Who is this son given to us? And when you take the time to examine and reflect and think deeply about these four names, you realize this is no, we should not sentimentalize this. This is God in flesh and blood the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. No doubt, prince of peace is the most Christmassy of all the names of Jesus, right? Because if you ask the average person, what's the meaning of Christmas? They'll say, you know, I don't know, hope, joy, peace, peace, joy, love, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, that kind of thing. But what do we mean when we say peace? What are we talking about when you and I say peace? Is it just the, the feeling you get once a year? When the kids come on stage, when we light the candles, that sort of inner sense of calm and quiet and familiarity and nostalgia like peace. Maybe watching whatever your favorite Christmas movie is, Miracle on 34th Street, Elf, Die Hard, whatever it is, right? <laughs> With a cup of cocoa, the fire going. Or if it's just that, a feeling you get, what about the other 364 days a year? Where's the Prince of Peace then? And let's be honest, December is not exactly the month of peacefulness in our culture. How many of you would say over the last four weeks, you've just felt this settled sense of calm and stillness, <laughs> not in a hurry, nothing stressing you out, focusing your mind on who God is? Not me. Is it, is it true for any of you? No, you could make the very strong case that this is the month of stress, consumeristic anxiety, overspending, overeating, overindulging, hurrying, lack of sleep. It's anything but peaceful. I read a, a Wall Street Journal article just earlier this month that said that inner peace is a booming business today, approaching a billion dollars a year, the search for inner peace. Deepak Chopra leading the way with his books. We're giving him inner peace by buying all of his nonsensical books. Apologies. No apologies, actually, for those of you that enjoy Deepak Chopra. The article goes through and highlights all of the crazy, wacky things people in our culture do in the pursuit of inner peace and how much we spend. Whatever you think about that, we could agree that whatever peace is, we appear to lack it and we appear to be desperately pursuing it. I'm going to read to you something called The Paradox of Our Time. Oddly enough, this, this little uh, essay has been attributed to the comedian George Carlin, who denied he ever wrote it. I tracked it down. It was written by a pastor in Seattle who's passed away now. He writes this. The paradox of our time in history is that we have taller buildings but shorter tempers, wider freeways but narrower viewpoints. We spend more but have less. We buy more but enjoy it less. Bigger houses, smaller families. More convenience, less time. More degrees but less sense. More knowledge but less judgment. More experts but more problems. More medicine, less true wellness. 
We drink too much, smoke too much, spend too recklessly, laugh too little, drive too fast, get angry too quickly, stay up too late, go to bed too tired, read too seldom, watch too many screens, and and pray too infrequently. We've multiplied our possessions and reduced our values. We talk too much, love too seldom, and hate too often. We've learned how to make a living, but not a life. We've added years to life, but not life to years. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but have trouble crossing the street to love our neighbor. We've conquered outer space, but not inner space. We've done larger things, but not better things. We've cleaned up the planet, but polluted the soul. We split the atom, but not our prejudice. We write more and learn less. We plan more and accomplish less. We've learned to rush, but not to wait. These are the times of fast food and slow digestion. Tall men who are short on character, steep profits, shallow relationships. These are the times of world peace and domestic violence. More leisure, less fun, more kinds of food, but less true nutrition and health. These are the days of two incomes and more divorce, fancier houses, broken homes, throwaway morality, one night stands, and pills that can do everything from cheer to quiet to kill. You might think that's kind of a downer to read on Christmas time, Pastor Jeff. And you might disagree with some of those lines. Whatever the case, I think we could all agree that we're not, the world is not a peaceful place. You don't have to pay, you don't have to pay that close attention to notice that. The world is full of trouble and darkness and difficulty and brokenness and pain. Yes, there are moments and glimpses of joy and light, but you have to look hard for those, don't you? The song by U2, Peace on Earth, asks a similar question about this dichotomy in our world. Some of you might know it. Bono wrote this song in the wake of the 1998 IRA bombings in Northern Ireland in his hometown. He writes, heaven on earth, we need it now. I'm sick of all this hanging around, sick of sorrow, sick of pain, sick of hearing again and again that there's going to be peace on earth. Jesus, can you take the time to throw a drowning man a line? Peace on earth. Tell the ones who hear no sound, whose sons are living in the ground, peace on earth. Nor whose are wise, and no one cries like a mother cries for peace on earth. Jesus, in the song you wrote, the words are sticking in my throat, peace on earth. Hear it every Christmas time, but hope and history don't rhyme. So what's it worth, this peace on earth? It's a good question. If Jesus is the truly the prince of peace, is he failing? Is he getting it wrong? Where is this peace on earth? Let's go back to the old familiar story in Luke chapter 2 and read what is so familiar to many of us. And by the way, you know, know, most of you, if you don't know this story from your own Bible reading, you know it from the Charles uh, Schultz Peanuts Christmas special. And who reads this story in Luke 2? Linus. And what is Linus always holding? His blankie. Do you know the one time in all the Peanuts movies when Linus puts down his blanket is... When he reads the Christmas story, isn't that interesting? I don't think Charles Schultz did that on accident. Puts down his false sense of security to read about the one who gives true security. Here's the story. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem. And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. It's so familiar, isn't it? You can almost hear, hear it read in Linus's voice. But 
if you pay attention to the context of this story, there's not much peaceful about this story. You have an unwed peasant girl who's pregnant. Now, being pregnant uh, without a husband is, is a difficult challenge at any time in history, let alone the first century AD in the region of Palestine. She's living just above the poverty line. She's barely a teenager. She's with child, it's, and Joseph's with her, and for his sake, it's not his baby. And not only that, but because of the oppression of Rome, the Roman Empire who dominates the landscape, the, and everything's about the almighty dollar and the Roman coin, they have to go make a long journey to Bethlehem, the town of their ancestors, to be counted. Why? So that Rome would know exactly how much they're due every year in their tax. Now, I don't know about you, but when my first child was born, Noah, he's 22 now, when he was born, we didn't, like, we didn't plan out a long trip on the day of his birth. I didn't say, let's go for a drive, honey. Let's end up somewhere else, right? Think about this. What's peaceful about this? A peasant girl who's unmarried, with child, a man, and it's not his baby, having to take a long trip to a different city that's not their hometown. It's the town of their ancestors, but at their hometown. And in that time, they, they have to give birth. And to make matters worse, they have no place to stay. They can't get in anywhere. The place is jammed with all the people who are having to do the same thing they're doing, travel for the census. So they have to give birth it would amounts to be a barn. And then on top of that, the king, the puppet king of the Jews, Herod, hears about this and is terrified about this new king being born, and he sets out to destroy that baby, killing all the babies under two years old. We don't, sing, we don't read about this much at Christmas time. We sort of sanitize that part. And they have to flee then from their homeland, Jerusalem, to Egypt and stay there until Herod dies. From a military, political, social, economic, and civil point of view, there's nothing peaceful at all about this story. But that's kind of the point. That God enters into an uncertain, insecure, dark, and broken world. It's a relevant story if you think about it. I mean, I don't know about you, but... I hear there's some political uncertainty in our culture these days. I hear there's some economic uncertainty, some strife between people, some division. This is the message of Christmas. We tend to think about peace as the absence of things. Like if you're, how many of you dads have ever said, can I just get some peace and quiet? What do you mean? You mean stop talking. Turn things off and don't make any noise for a minute, right? The absence of noise and stress, right? Or on a larger scale, more serious, we think of peace as the absence of conflict. Let's not fight. Can we just get along? But from the biblical perspective, peace is about so much more than the absence of something. The Hebrew word for peace is, some of you will know this. Some of you, how do, do you know what the Hebrew word for peace is? Shalom. When my wife and I traveled to Israel with Pastor Brian and his wife a number of years ago, you heard this all the time, people greeting each other, Shalom. Think of it, if all that sh peace meant, shalom meant, was just let's not fight. Think how weird that would be. People saying shalom, shalom, let's not fight, let's not fight, let's not fight, let's not fight. That's a weird greeting, right? They're not saying that. What are they saying? Shalom, from the biblical perspective, was not about the absence of conflict, but about wholeness, completeness, total well-being of body, mind, soul, and heart in every way. So when you say shalom to somebody, you're not just saying, I hope there's no stress in your life. I hope you don't fight. You're saying, I wish you total well-being of body, mind, and soul. Shalom. Jesus is called the Sar Shalom. Sar, we get the word Tsar from this root Hebrew word, same root word. Or Caesar, it means ruler, one who's in charge, captain or chief. He's in charge of Shalom. He's the captain of it. He rules it. He is it. So how do you get this shalom? How do you get this sense of total well-being, not just the absence of conflict? We won't see it on the screen, but in Numbers chapter 6, the great priestly blessing, it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace, shalom. If you think about what that's saying, the great blessing to God's people is, let God turn his face toward you. That's poetic imagery for God's heart toward you, God's inclination toward you. Your relationship with him is what brings you peace. 
You see, the biblical concept of peace is not about the absence of something. It's about the presence of someone. Emmanuel, God with us. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Jesus says you're going to have trouble in this life. Peace is the presence of God. Peace is knowing that God loves you. Listen to how the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 2. I'll read these, these verses for you. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And he's reconciled us to God in one body through the cross, killing hostility. And he, became, he came and preached peace to you who are far off and preached peace to you who are near. You know what Paul says? Paul says, he himself is our peace. Now, if I bring peace to a place or to people, if you, like when I, years ago when I got my kids a Wii, remember the Wii? That's like so outdated now, we don't even use it. But remember, it was a big deal. We got Wii for Christmas. Um, I don't even know what the game system that's popular now is, but we got Wii, Wii. And so my kids were so excited. We made a hunt with clues to find the Wii. And invariably what happened over Christmas break is there was a lack of peace in the home because they fought over whose turn it was. We only had two controllers. That was a huge error on my part. I have three children. Duh, duh. So, but I bought two controllers. They fought over who got to play and what game they were going to play. So what would I, I would be upstairs watching an important game on television, and they'd be downstairs fighting, lack of peace in the basement, right? You've heard this analogy before. And I would descend to them. I would incarnate my wisdom and peace in, in the basement. And usually what this meant was trying to give them good advice. And then eventually what it meant was I'm playing. And I played Mario Kart. And I always fell off the rainbow road. And I hate that rainbow road. <laughs> lack of peace, right? Or maybe on a more serious note, we talk about peace treaties or peace accords or peace negotiations. It, it's good counsel, wise words, good advice to try to, everybody calm down. Let's let cooler heads prevail. Let's figure this out together. That's not the kind of peace Jesus brings. The Sar Shalom is not bringing you good advice. The peace he brings is not, hey, hey, kids, let's not fight. The peace he brings is a purchased peace. He bought it with his own blood. He paid for it at the cross. And it's so easy to miss that this time of year. To run right by all the traditions, to all the fun, and just move on to the new year. But I want to encourage you to ask this question. Do you know this peace? Not the inner sense of feeling you get once a year. Not good advice to follow. Not nostalgic and sentimentality. Not even the absence of conflict. Jesus said in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you will have peace. In this life you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. That's the peace he offers. And you can get it no other way. If you stop for a minute as we just close here and think about those four names of Jesus, they're not only telling you something about Jesus, they're telling you something about you. Wonderful counselor, what's that tell you about who you are? Well, you're kind of dumb. Ignorant, foolish, lost, confused. Anybody ever thought, I don't know what to do about this situation? Mighty God, you're weak and you're vulnerable. Everlasting Father, you're isolated and alone. You're a spiritual orphan in the world. Prince of Peace, you're full of stress and anxiety and conflict. Between you and God and you and other people and you and yourself. So God is not the cosmic vending machine where sometimes you can get a little wonderful counsel and a little bit of his mighty power and a little bit of a fatherly love and a little bit of peace whenever you need it. And the rest of the time, ignore him. Jesus is not calling you to follow his good advice or to remember the baby in the manger. He's calling you to lay down your life. Surrender to him. The Sar Shalom. That's the way, that's the path to peace, friends. That's what he offers. It's our tradition to close this service by singing Silent Night. Here's how we'll do that. In a moment, I'll pray, and, and we'll begin to sing. And as the music begins, I'll light the last candle left, which is the Christ candle. We used to use real flames, but then a woman caught her hair on fire, and so now we use these. <laughs> and after, uh, after I do that, I'll come down, and I'll symbolically pass the light to each of you. Leave your candles off until the person next to you or in front of you passes the light to you. And let, as you see the room lit up, let that be a symbol to you of the way the peace and love of the Lord Jesus flows from life to life to those on whom his favor rests. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, you indeed are our peace. You yourself are our peace. You do not offer us rules to follow or advice to heed. You offer us yourself. For many of us here, we know that we just forget. Pray that your spirit would remind us. For some here, they know about you, but they do not know you as the prince of peace over their life. And God, I pray by your spirit that even now, you would not just be a prince of peace, but their prince of peace ruling in their hearts. We thank you for the depth of your love. Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you.